Good afternoon. I, I want to welcome you to the third and final installment of this really important work we're engaged in here at the college and, and the community. If anyone in here who doesn't know who I am, and you haven't been here the last two days, I am Tawanda Jordan. I'm the president of the college, and I'm just happy that you're all here. Our commemoration project is so important to our community, both internal and external. The enslaved peoples, many of whom helped cultivate and nurture this land, even in the face of atrocities, are the foundation of our community and our nation. I want to give you a brief overview of how St. Mary's College, College journeyed to this very moment where we are preparing to construct a commemorative site to ensure that we never forget to remember our past in all of its beauty and brutality. In October of 2017, an archaeological study of the Jamie L. Roberts Stadium site discovered slave dwellings from two distinct periods, the 18th and 19th century, that predated the founding of the college. We decided it was important to relocate the site of the athletic stadium in order to preserve archaeological features to the greatest extent possible. Working with the executive council, we decided that we needed to inform the community. But how? We took the academic approach, which means we had to have meetings. And we had many meetings. And at some point, they became the focused meetings. And from those focused meetings, we drafted a plan. We wanted to be open and honest about what was found, as well as collaborative with the community stakeholders. The plan included making a community-wide presentation with various stakeholders speaking. We tested the presentation using both internal and external focus groups. This was and is a community endeavor. I made opening remarks about the significance of the discovery to the college and to this place. A faculty member, Julie King, described what was discovered about the site and the people who lived there. An administrator, Chip Jackson, presented the implications of the discovery on the construction of the athletic stadium. A community member, Regina Fodden, put the discovery in the context of Southern Maryland history. I established a commemoration committee led by Jeff Coleman, who's professor of English and coordinator of African and African diaspora studies. And I asked him to coordinate our commemoration efforts. The commemoration committee members are Iris Ford, Kent Rendell, Gary Denny, Ellen Cole, Christine Woolley, Annie Anguiera, Jada Ward, and Jeff Coleman. If you are in the room, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Under the leadership of the Commem Commemoration Committee, St. Mary's College engaged in pre-concept efforts including a benchmarking study and identification of potential themes and how to put this discovery into the broader context of our being stewards of the public trust and educators. For the sake of time, let us forward, fast forward a year later. In October of 2018, we recruited CODA Works to guide our search for an artist for the commemorative site. Out of 57 submissions, Coda Works determined that 28 met our minimum criteria. The selection committee identified three finalists who were given an opportunity to visit the site, engage with the community, prepare, and ultimately present their proposals to us, the reason we're here today. The selection committee members include Iris Ford, Lisa Shear. Michael Brown, who's St. Mary's County Art Council, Chip Jackson, Paul Pusiker, and Maurice Schlesinger. Will you guys please stand and be recognized if you're in the room? I too served as a member on this committee. And now here we are at this moment in time. As we prepare to engage with the artist and imagine how to bring our commemorative site to life, let us remember that this commemorative, commemorative is about more than simply remnants and relics. It serves as a reminder of the many lives that existed at this place at that time. This is our history. Our present becomes our past. 
Our past informs our future. It is our responsibility to do our part in making it a better one. It is important to note that this commemorative is not a standalone effort or a one-off. It is a step in what should be a long-term collaboration and partnership with local, regional, and national experts and organizations to learn and to educate. It is part of a bigger effort to fully understand the history of this place, the enslaved people who lived here, and the impact they had and continue to have on this region and in our nation. It is indeed a story and celebration of resistance, resilience and persistence, innovation and creativity, traits and characteristics that contributed to their survival, traits and characteristics that are essential for our continued collective ability to not only survive but to thrive in both the present and in the future. In a few minutes, I will introduce our artist of the evening. The artist will present and then take a few minutes, a few audience questions during the question and answer. When you have a question, please make sure you speak into a mic because we're trying to record this and it's important that the equipment picks it up. Anna and Cynthia will be your runners and they will be paying attention and if not, I will send them to you. Please note that on your program, there is a link to a site where we invite you to go to the site and provide your comments on the presentation. You, those of you who are not, have not been here all three nights, very soon you will be able to go to the site and look at all of the presentations. I ask you to do that before submitting a vote because you want it to be fair. And it's important that you see the different perspectives on what the site should be, and you should take all of that into consideration so you can make an informed decision. We're a liberal arts institution, critical thinking, taking into account all the evidence, and not just from your emotion, even though art should be emotive. So now I'm going to introduce our artist this evening, Steve Price, Prince, oi. Someone who's president of college should be able to read a word on a piece of paper, don't you think? Steve Prince, native of New Orleans, Louisiana, currently resides in Williamsburg, Virginia. Prince holds a BFA from Xavier University of Louisiana and an MFA in printmaking and sculpture from Michigan State University. He is currently the Director of Engagement and Distinguished Artists in Residence at Muscarelle Museum of Art at the College of William and Mary. He is represented by Zucott Gallery in Atlanta, Georgia. Prince has received a number of honors for his art and scholarship. He has shared his art internationally in solo, group, and juried ex exhibitions, and has participated in several residencies, including the 2007 Partners of the Americas Artists in Residence in Santa Catarina, Brazil. He has lectured and conducted workshops in both secular and sacred settings internationally in a variety of media. Prince has operated under the credo your imagination is your only limitation. Without further ado, please help me give a warm St. Mary's College welcome to Steve Prince. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's both a privilege and an honor to be able to come here and share with you this evening. Uh, I thank you all for coming out here um, to see the work that I would love to share uh, with the college. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of an outline in terms of what I'm going to try to do this evening. The first thing I would love to do is, is give you a little bit of the philosophical foundations of my work. Um, so you have a little bit of a bite into where my thinking comes from in terms of how I construct and how I deal with the work. Um, I will move from the philosophical foundation of my work directly into the piece that I would love to deposit on this campus and engage the community with. 
And so we'll go from those two, those two particular formats. And I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. And in New Orleans, there's a tradition there that's called the bambula. It goes all the way back to the time of slavery. The bambula, of course, is also the circle dance. And the circle dance would basically come about at times when the slave master gave the slave an opportunity to have some free time. And that typically took place on a Sunday. And many times, that was a place where there was a ret retention of the rituals that was embedded within the African culture turned American. And in this circle dance, many times what would happen is the people would dance, and they would dance to a point where sometimes they would dance into a frenzy that clothing would be removed, not as an act of lewdness, but the clothing would be removed as a sign that they're ridding themselves of those things that are attached to this earth. And they are becoming more and deeply connected to the spirit realm. Therefore, many times you would hear the person begin to stalk, talk in tongues. And that idea of the talking in tongues that would take place in this bamboo the circle dance is very much alive within the black church living very well in America and around the world. This place also con is um, it's also called Congo Square. Congo Square is located in the oldest African-American municipality in the United States, which is called Trime, um, also in New Orleans. Keep pushing the wrong button. Let me try to get this right. The philosophical foundation of my work comes out of the funerary tradition in New Orleans, which is broken up into two parts. The first part of the funeral is called the dirge, which is a mournful tune that is played for someone that's being laid to rest. The musicians would purposely play music to get you to cry, to get you to pour out in the process of this funeral. But once the person is laid to rest, the music then transforms into a celebratory tune, and the people begin to celebrate that person that no longer has to suffer, now that person has moved on into the afterlife. The second line has multiple meanings. One thing that may come to mind as you think about the, from a conceptual standpoint is like, well, what is the first line? Well, the first line is our life here on earth right now. The second line is the afterlife. The first line also alludes to the family that's connected to the person that is being laid to rest. The second line is the community that comes out and girds that person that's being laid to rest, and girds the family, and gives them support, and gives them love. The dirge music sounds a little bit like this. In the image that I created, which this one is actually a woodcut, it shows different people moving and processing, going to the gravesite. And you can see the musicians playing and the reverberation of sounds are coming off of his horn. As you see the guy, the guy walking in the foreground, you see the child who is crying because of the loss of his father as the mother drapes her arm around him, consoling him in this moment of bereavement. As you can see, the obituary is being held in the hand of the mother inside of the compositional space. Now, on one level, I just made a representation of the idea of the dirge, but I told you that it was the philosophical foundation of my work and that the dirge now, hoping that we can think about the dirge as the different issues and the things that are going on societally that we all are dealing with, that we're grappling with. Let's take the dirge and let the dirge be represent race and representation. Let's let the dirge be representation of issues of sexism. Let's let the dirge be those things that we have to deal with internally within ourselves. That's the dirge, which is part of the everyday. I believe if we grapple with that dirge, I believe that we don't have to die in order to receive the second line, to receive the celebration. I believe if we grapple with it individually, but I also believe if we grapple with it collectively or communally, I believe that we all can receive a second line in terms of that process of embracing those things, those hurts in the, of that past. And so what does the second line sound like when we get there?
And in the composition, now the musicians are processing through the streets in the once mournful tomb that was being played for the person being laid to rest. Now the celebration is kicking in. Many things that you'll see in the New Orleans context, you see people pull out white handkerchiefs and you see them flaying them in the air and you're like, oh, that's a really nice little kind of little side prop that they have, but the, the handkerchief has a deep meaning to it in terms of its representation. You want to pick it back up? Or is that me? Did I knock it out? There we go. Good. The handkerchief has multiple meanings in that in one meaning it has is, of course, for the wiping away the tears when a person is crying and pouring out. But the other meaning of the handkerchief in terms of its representation, it is a representation of the Holy Spirit. And how do we get there? We get there because at funerals and weddings they release white doves. That was an idea that the person would, for a funeral situation is about the spirit being carried away into the heavens. For a wedding situation, the white doves would be released because it was a covering over the couple. It got expensive at funerals and weddings for this to take place, so it got translated into a white handkerchief. And so when you see a person in New Orleans dance with this white handkerchief, they become a representation of the Holy Spirit as it flows through them through the white handkerchief as they begin to animate it and bring it to life. A piece that I created at the College of William and Mary, I was commissioned by, by the college to create a piece to commemorate the first three African Americans that were resident students at the College of William and Mary in 1967. These three women entered into the college, like I said, for the first time amidst the history that the college was started over 325 years ago. Uh, ironically, these three women stayed in the, the basement of Jefferson Hall. And these three women entered that, at the schools in that particular time in 1967, over 52 years ago, amidst the history of a slavery past in terms of William and Mary, which also had sl slaves on its campus. In this context, they had slaves that they used to sell to keep students at the college. The slaves also washed the clothes of the different students, and the slaves also were sold to keep certain students in place so that they can continue to go to school. This history was unearthed through a project called the Lemon Project. And so I, when I was invited to be there at the campus, I ended up working with 12 students over the course of one month, and we created this project where I unearthed that history, as I show you a, a window that's on the Wren building. That window is translated into a slave ship the lemons are falling from the sky down into the fields as the people are dancing, as the people are moving and the spirit is moving through them as they're dealing with the issues of they were being handed lemons and how they take those lemons and turn them into lemonade. And the other side of the compositional space, it becomes a representation of the future, of where we possibly could be and possibly where we can go as a collective, as a, as a people. In the background is a quilt pattern, which is called the hourglass. Jacqueline Tobin and Raymond Dobard postulate that during, uh, during the time of slavery, the abolitionists and uh, slaves conspired together and created a secret code system that they embedded within the, um, uh, within the quilts that give them information about how to navigate the south to the north into freedom. Also, as part of the whole project, the 12 students, I paired them together. The two students did not know each other when they were paired together, and they were pulled plaster masks off of each other's faces. When they took the plaster mask off their faces, we then took wax out of those. And the two students that they just got paired together had to study the genealogical past of each other and take those two masks and turn them into one. So these representations that you see at the bottom of the structure are representations of two masks made into one, where it becomes a marrying of the two histories and the creation of a new history at the bottom of the compositional space, alluding to the idea that it's like a seed that's being planted and hopefully it would germinate and create new connections. This site here is directly on the campus, right across the street from the campus. And this is where the site where I began to get the formulation about how I was going to begin to approach this particular project. This artwork that I'm about to share with you is dedicated to the indigenous people that inhabited this region. The Pamunkey, the Haudenosaunee, 
the Piscataway. This work is dedicated to the people of the Senegambia region, the Gold and Windward Coast, the Bight of Biafra, Sierra Leone, Benin, Angola, and West Central Africa. This work is dedicated to all of the unsung heroes who survived the arduous Middle Passage, to all those who conspired to return home, to those whose unmarked graves lies at the bottom of the, of the Atlantic, to those who withstood the crack of the master's whip, to those who navigated the terrain of Jim Crow, and to those who suffered the hangman's noose in kangaroo courts. This work is dedicated to those who took lemons and made lemonade, to those who protected the rituals and customs and passed them on to another generation to those whose talents and gifts have shaped and defined this world, and to those whose spirit grew stronger in the face of a system that tried to kill it. I dedicate this artwork to the mothers and fathers who placed the song upon their lips and sang. I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free, no longer bound, no more chains holding me. My soul is resting, and it's a blessing indeed. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, I'm free. I dedicate this piece to the invisible made visible in Freedom's House. What I propose to create is put meat upon the bones of those skeletons that are around this campus. And the meat upon the bones is to put the people who actually built the homes, the people who built the communities, the people who were enslaved, the people who built this nation, who built the railroads, the people who built the White House, the people who went all over the different places, one generation to the next, carrying that pain. I want to show the issue of them all linked together, not in the, pos not in the state of that they're in a state of servitude, but a state of them help helping each other to withstand the resilience, the strength, the creativity, the love, the generations being dispelled by the body and showing the, the pregnancy, I want to create a house on that particular site. So when we walk across that field and going towards that, that football field, that we will see this house off in the distance and we see the shape. But the closer we get up to it, we then will note that it is made up of people. I don't want us to stop there. I want us to know what the roof is made of of this structure. Because this roof will be made up of the community. This roof, I want it to be made of the different people in the community. I want us to go back and find the descendants of the slaves. I want to find the descendants of the slave owners and have an opportunity that we go to them and we will pull a plaster mask off of their face, engage them in this conversation, and that we would engage the Hicks, the Mackles, and the Broom families. We would engage the students on this campus that have come from all over this nation to this particular space and we would take plaster mask off of their faces and translate those into metal, and that will become part of the roof because then we will become the protectors of that history. I want to move into the internal of the structure that when you walk around it and walk through the door inside of it, now you are on the external space of the particular piece. Now you come into the inside. I want the representations of those Native Americans who I spoke of. I want the representation of the different African cultural groups and how they came in here and deposited this information into this particular land, how they transformed this entire world, how, how they came in with the banjo in their hand, how they came in and transformed the, the music of jazz, how they came in with the black power movement, how they came in with the quilts that I just talked about, and this particular one is called the Flock of Birds, how they came in and fought to vote, how they came in and um, um, inside this space in terms of the schools and integrations and in terms of how they broke those barriers. I even want to make allusions to different people that were stood, like Linda Brent, who stood inside of an attic for seven years, hiding from a slave master in, um, in a grandmother's house, wanting to be able to have a space where we can come in there and have a spot of contemplation. And I'm going to call this the mourner's bench. So when you enter this space, you have an opportunity to sit down 
and engage all around you and see the living history that's all inside of this room and those people represented um, that are th of this land. You see, in terms of the site of the elevation, this is a, a view facing south towards the, um, towards the, um, the stadium, You're getting a sense of the, of the structure about 18 feet tall, roughly, um, that I would love to um, produce this uh, piece in. And then to give you another sense of the site, remember that wall, the door opening will be facing south. So when you engage the building, it will look like it's impenetrable. But when you walk around it to the other side, you would note that that becomes the door opening that you can actually walk in, that people can freely walk into Freedom's House and engage the external and the internal body. want to engage a whole community-based project. The community-based project will, I will draw from students from William & Mary who have gone through a similar kind of historical past, draw upon students from there, and also draw upon students from this college to engage in going out and collecting the data, collecting the mass from the community. And they will become like the, conceptually like the evangelists for this particular project to go around and spread the information. So we will go and get the mask off of the different faces of different people and begin to collect, collect all this information and utilize the casting process of C.F. Perdue or the lost wax system where we enca encapsulate these things into molds and then we'll pour the metal um, of this particular, of, um, to create the metal of these particular images in order to create these masks which will create the roof of the structure. And the roof will act as preservers of the history but also witnesses to the ways in which we can engage that past with a new eyes. The idea of us facing that dirge with the hope of renewal of us having a communal second line. Thank you. You mentioned the materials for the roof. What are some of the other materials for the walls, the chimney, and so forth? Um, I didn't go into much detail in explaining the materials of the structure. Um, the materials, I'm going to have uh, primarily uh, four different materials for the, for the structure I'm proposing. Um, one will be bronze, one will be aluminum, one will be steel, and the other one will be a, um, a, a, a resin um, type of material. Um, polyester resin. So those would be the four different materials. For the roof, I want to go with aluminum because I want to make sure we reduce on the weight but also reduce on the cost factor in terms of the production of it. Um, in, in contrast, uh, it could be the whole structure could be bronze but this piece would get extremely expensive and I think it would break our budget. So therefore, I would like to get that done with aluminum so we have, um, you know, um, we have that nice really strong reflective surface on the top that would give a really nice co color contrast with the overall composition, but also reduce our cost and reduce the amount of weight for the entire structure. So that that will become structurally become a, a you know, that's one particular element that I was thinking about in terms of how do we solve those particular issues. I guess you have to wait for the mic. <laughs> Hi, you mentioned that um, you were gonna like this. Okay. Oh, stand up. Okay, sorry. Um, you mentioned that you were going to work with um, William & Mary students who have done the mask process before, but that you were also going to work with um, St. Mary's community members, and I'm assuming you meant like of the college. Um, is that going to be current members? Or are you going to reach out to alumni? How is that process going to work out? Um, I hadn't thought about the element of, of looking at alumni. But I wanted to def I was thinking definitely about the current members of the college. Uh, I think it's so important that I draw upon students from the college where I'm at um, and dealing with a very similar history. I mean, only like two hours away from each other. We're actually closer than that. I just had to go a much longer route to get here. If they had a bridge come over here, pri I'm probably like about an hour away from here. <laughs> and, um, but I think that would be very important for students from that particular site to travel to another site, engage with students at this site, and for us to both collectively go through that process. I think it's first it's going to be important for the William & Mary students to work with the St. Mary students together on that process of doing the mass work. And then we will create different cohorts and groups 
over, I, I have it in my, in my um, overall plan for about three months, we will go out into the community and collect the, collect the mask, conceptually the data, to, in order to create the roof. Because we're going to need quite a few masks um, in order to create um, the structure. But I want to be able to go and find as many of the descendants um, of those different families that we know of and that we don't know of. And I think that it's going to be so important for this project where we have the students to be able to not only engage the students right here on the campus that come from all over the nation, all around the world, um, but I think that it becomes so important for them to directly engage in the community and go out and make those direct connections and share with them what this history is. And they'll have opportunity to deposit that information there and make these direct connections. I think we'll wait for the mic. I have a question out of ignorance. No problem. I'm thinking that since the roof is going to be made with the, uh, with people's features, or faces, right? Is it? Yes. I'm wondering with the elements, given that a face, the features of a face has so many nooks and crannies, won't debris and bird poop and moss and so forth collect on it so that you can no longer see the features? Um, the, I think all any public work that's out is going to have that issue. But as far as our faces are concerned, um, we don't have that many like deep crevices and things where stuff can actually settle too much. So we have a natural buildup in terms of anatomically where things will tend to fall straight off. Like if we drop water, water just don't puddle on our face. It hits and it keeps going off because of the beautiful design in which we are. And so that up there on, there, on, the, on the roof, that will help to keep that kind of flow. Um, in terms of that design-wise. But as far as any kind of bird pooping on it, that's, there's, only, there's no way to stop that. <laughs> so will and, moss grow? I'm sorry? Will moss grow on metal? Not, not, not here. It no. doesn't? We're not, we're not going to have that issue. Okay. No. I like your approach. Oh, dude, thank you. I think we have over here. Hi. Um, I just had a question. I'm curious about how the, um, just because I can't see it very well, how the bodies on the outside are interacting with each other. Like, if you could go a little more in depth about that. Okay. Let me go back. And in that same vein, interacting with the people who are, like, walking past it or engaging with it. Um, so I'm just going to repeat what I think I heard you say. You just want to know exactly how the figures are interacting? Oh, what I have here, and if you came up closer, you'll see that I have the people literally holding the roof up. They're holding each other up. They're acting as almost like as if they're like armatures, and they, they, each person is grabbing and pushing and holding and pulling. So it's like, think of it this way. When I was a child, um, we had a chain link fence in the backyard. And the chain link fence was always interesting to me just in terms of the overall diamond pattern that it made. Now, of course, if my mom heard me, what I did right now, she'd be really upset. But what I did was I was out there cutting the grass one day, and I took the shears and I cut a section of it. And when I cut it, it popped and created a big hole inside the fence. Because what I realized, and when I cut that thing, one, I couldn't go back. I couldn't pull it back together, but I created, the whole fence was on tension, so it pulled apart. And if we think about that in terms of community, if we think about it structurally, that's why it's a little hard to see. It's because I literally got people intertwining. They're literally like a knot almost together. And everybody's holding and doing their part in order to hold community together. If we remove this guy right here out of there, a whole section will fall out. Because it's so important for each individual to play its part in order to hold community together. When we start thinking about civil rights history and so forth, many times we think about a Martin Luther King's and we think about um, a sojourn of truth, and we think about a Harriet Tubman, we think about these people because they stand out because they were the, the, the figureheads or the voices and so forth. But the thing that we forget is all the other people, oh, the, the droves of people who came out that did the work, that did the work to create the change, and that did the work that, that fought against those systems and created freedom. Those same people who went out there who got hit with the hoses, those same people who got attacked by the dogs, those same people who got lynched, those names, many of those names we lost. And I'm not necessarily trying to say we're going to pull all those names back, but what I want to do is show through the artistic piece is the community working and holding together in order to build and create a house. So if we think about that as the exoskeleton of the structure, then once you move into it, then I want to reveal something else to you. I want it to shift from that whole idea of them holding, pushing together. Now 
you're in this room where it's a room of reverence, where you got these people standing all around and looking down right at you. And their bodies are like living text or epistles. You can read them. And you can read the history. You read the mask and where it comes from. You read the element that's juxtaposed to that character inside of his hand. You read the clothing, and all that information will be deposited before you as you engage the piece and have an opportunity to just take a minute and just sit there and maybe have a, a moment of mourning, but get up and move back out of the house and know that you have this information that comes from this place, but then take that message and pass it on. That's part of getting closer and closer to that second line, I believe. So that's where my brain was going. That's why I shared that idea of the dirge on the second line inside of the composition so that you can understand that the external, on one level, it looks a little bit like middle passage, but I wasn't totally trying to evoke that. I was really mostly evoking, if you, and especially if you came up closer, you better see it better to see the figures interacting together um, and so forth. But from a distance, it's doing just what I was hoping it would do. It will be hard for you to see it. You know, when you get back from a distance, it'll look just like a house. Then the closer and closer you get, you're like, whoa, those are people. The entire house is made of people. Even a chimney is made of people. So I hope that answers your question. Indeed. Any other questions? So trying to understand your uh, um, illustration well. So you envision these wall surfaces as a deep relief. I mean, I'm, I'm not right because I'm seeing on some images looking like, you know, you know, one foot or more deep relief, or is it very shallow? You also, in your in, in your rendering, show various colors. And I don't know if that's just to, you know, because if this is all bronze and it's a even, you know, brown, you know, like what, what do you envision though, you know, because you've explained the roof very clearly to me, Indeed. but what are some of the, uh, your ideas about constructing and the way that the materials will interact with the vertical surfaces? Absolutely. As far as the structure, what I'm showing in terms of the drawing, it shows a little bit higher relief than where we'll probably be able to go. Um, the, I will do relief and then some elements do high relief. If I did them all as three-dimensional figures, we're going to talk about, again, we're going to break our budget. <laughs> so I have to go with relief. And you think about relief, for those who don't know what relief is, it's like if you think of like a coin, that is considered to be very, very low, very shallow relief. I'm going to go much higher than that. So I'm going to have the elements to actually figures projecting off of the surface. Some spots where you actually will feel a whole three-dimensional form push out of there. But I won't do that all over the, on design. And I would intersperse where some of this stuff would be flatter, and then some of these things would be more dimensional, create a more didactic surface. As you talked about the coloration on there, um, I will go with um, almost, uh, I want to create a different kind of, different tones of patina, what is called the patina, or the patination on the surface of the metal. And I didn't want, want just one kind of solid color. I wanted it to be an array of colors on there. And I thought about the whole idea of the array of colors as it relates to just the array of us as people. If you think about black people, brown people, you know, and the different colors and the tones. And so I figured that needs to play its way into it as well and not just have this monotone kind of structure. So I wanted that to play in terms of that, that which we can control as much as we can in terms of creating a patina on the surface. But definitely, um, to go back to your first statement about the idea of the high relief, um, there will be some elements of high relief, but then definitely there'll be much lower in order to control the, the cost factor of creating such a house like this. Because we're talking, um, what I didn't say um, in terms of the way, uh, it's, it's in my, the, the, the panel presentation of it, but it's um, about 12 to 14 feet wide, about 16 feet that way, and 18 feet at right, the apex. And so what I want to do is make sure the roof is a pretty high pitch so we get an opportunity as you walk up to it to be able to see the, um, the faces up there. So it'll be kind of, um, it'll, be, it'll be a pretty high uh, A-frame or apex that'll be created in order to create that illusion. So when you walk up to it, you better get a chance to pick out maybe it may be find your face. It's going to be very hard for a person to find a face because it's going to be full of faces. Now, another thing is, too, to keep the cost down for the project, um, the mask, all the masks, I'm, I'm going to do those and the foundry at the College of Women Mary. And I'll work with the students working with the sculpture class in order to be able to produce the, the mask. So a portion of the production will take place here, and then we'll take a portion of the production at St. Mary's and then transport it to... Uh, women marriage in order to do that particular portion of it. Other element too is that I will do some of the casting directly here on the campus um, um, and so forth. I have a portable foundry so I'll bring that here and I'll be able to engage the community so they can actually see how their face goes from a plaster 
into a wax, into the sprueing system added onto it, into the mold built around that, to the burning out, the pouring of the metal, the breaking out, the cleaning up, and preparing it for the actual display. So it's going to be, everyone's going to get a chance to see all the steps. It's going to be a completely transparent project. And then, then literally we have the agency of not only the students at the school, but we have the agency of the community. Then when we have this whole idea of the community unveiling of this piece, you know, how powerful would that be when the people come here to find their face as part of this production? You know, so as, as part of that community piece. And so we have a beautiful moment in terms of the celebration to really engage the community in some really real and powerful ways. And I can just imagine the amount of people that they will bring back to come see this piece, you know, and say, oh, baby, my face is up there. Look at it over there in the third row, you know? And that becomes part of that, you know, you got this piece that is not just a piece that I, as an artist, just made and just planted here. The community actually helped in the making of it. I'm a fellow New Orleanian, so oh, I appreciate the Indeed. vision. I appreciate how you got here. Um, I'm wondering, really simple question maybe, what's it look like at night? All right, is oh. this just daytime, or how, how's it going to no, look no, later? No, we, no, we, it's got to have lights. <laughs> and uh, if you note, I applied some lights external to it, um, that it will light it up, they'll illuminate it. And the last design element I have not cited on, and what, what I would do is, if I, the next phase that I would do is prototype it to see how it would work. I, I think I want to create uh, points of penetration in there. So if light is inside, imagine seeing the distant shards of light pushing out of this. That's in my head. I just got to prototype it to see if that'll be the thing. And do we have it as an enclosed structure where you can't uh, see penetration into the internal structure? Or do we keep it a, a place where you can actually walk up to it and look through a section? I have not fully decided on that as a designer. Um, but I, I think I'm leaning more towards having the light push out of it at nighttime. But definitely it's going to be lit up outside. That's what these circular forms on the bottom. And I got a little bit of yellow illumination coming off of them to shoot out. So I want you to be able to see this at nighttime. And imagine just riding down that road and turn your head to the right or riding down the road and turn your head to the left and see this beacon in the field, you know, bomb, popping out there right on that meandering road. And so the road that's coming off of that, I want to basically come off of it. And if you can notice, I create a bump around it, that, not the road, the pathway, which is about 10 feet wide that leads all the way to the stadium. I want to create a bump off of it so you have an, actually a diversion along the path. So you're walking along, then you can walk off into the structure, but then you can keep on back on the path and keep going. So that, that was design-wise where I was thinking. But it's to literally extend that 10-foot, pull, pull the, the, the path over towards the piece. Hope I answered your question. Indeed. I have another question right over behind you. So oh, she has it. Okay. So Go. I. No. What is that? Right here? That's the field going back. That's the perspective line right here. Oh, okay. And that's off in the distance. Those are trees, the wooded area past the, a field that's out there where some of the digging took place. So that's the field goes all the way back, and then it keeps going back, and it's a wooded area. I probably could have did a little better job in terms of artistic could have created more of a gradation, created a little darker, made it go lighter. That, that, would made it, that would probably made the illusion a little bit greater. And then there's some translation loss in terms of the, from an actual piece to the digital um, and the lighting. I feel a little bit darker in here, it'll probably show up better too. So that's the artist in me now talking. Yes. <laughs> Hi, so I have a comment and then um, a question which you've kind of anticipated already. And the comment is really about the fact that I really love the way that this piece takes some of the insights that I often see in 19th century writers who, who give really a, a sort, who who work to represent um, a sort of exploitation that happens in the making and through the through slave labor and through the making of sites in the South um, and makes it literal, right? So if slave labor goes into building buildings, then it is bodies that have been consumed by that labor and that becomes literal in your piece, but it also becomes beautiful. And I find that a really moving transformation that your, um, that your concept has presented. Um, my, my question is, is actually partially answered, I think, by what you were saying about the lighting. Um, I couldn't help but think about the summer, and maybe because I'm not a New Orleanian, but I am a Floridian, and so I often think about heat in the summer. And so I was thinking about the ways that if, if, it, was, if it wasn't solid, and if there was possibility of, of air or breeze coming through, 
that that becomes a site that's restful in the summer as well as um, a site of sort of shelter if it's colder in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that that could be, could sort of make it I don't know, more, I don't want to say welcoming, but, mm -hmm. but more sort of sheltering, I guess. Mm. Um, and so I, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about the ways that that, if you make it, if you give the, if, if not all of the walls are solid, if it makes that sort of, it makes it more inviting, but also then perhaps echoes the ghost frame houses right. in the, around St. Mary City. Absolutely. That was, that was, that was my main, quote. when I walked around the campus and they were telling me the story and I remember going into the house that was, it was almost like a, a double slave house where the, the fireplace is more or less in the center of the house. And I remember walking on one side and I'm looking at the bed and I see sheets and I looked at the wall and I saw a remnant and one thing that really struck me when I walked around and got into the fireplace and there was this little vial of oil that was there. And I said, well, what was that? And they said, well, they found it tucked away inside the fireplace. And they didn't have any more explanation about it. But I thought about that from a spiritual context. I thought about that in terms of the church and the idea that not only the oils could be used in terms of medicinal purposes, but the oil was used in the spiritual purpose. When somebody would take the oil and put the sign of the cross on your forehead, that's what I remember in the church that I came up in, the Assemblies of God Church, that's what the pastor would do when they would put a blessing on you. And so I was like, that part was hidden away because they didn't want, to, they didn't want people to attach onto that oil because that was part of their blessing. That was part of their spiritual practices, those things that were kind of hidden. So I was thinking about that. And then the next thing that hit me, struck me, as I'm walking around, I'm seeing all different sites, and I'm seeing all these skeleton building kind of structures, and I'm like, it's like, yeah, we're talking about it, and we can see the stuff in the field, but we don't really, we haven't, we haven't finished that sentence. And so that's where I figured, that's why I went to the literal and said, let's finish the sentence. If we say that America was built by that labor, then what does it look like? You know, and what does that house look like if we know and we see that that house is made up of the people? You know, and that, that gets manifested. And I am leaning towards what you said about creating a penetration for double reason, for a number of reasons. And I have, I think that the other element, and I have some sketch designs of it too is that opposing wall that you walk up on, I'm thinking about creating that wall as a wall of text, but the text to be cut out of steel. That when you walk up to it, it'll be cut out of core tin steel, core tin steel, which would rust naturally. And that would be this brown wall with this cut penetration coming through. So that's the other element I'm thinking about dealing with. And that, again, will reduce our cost for the project, but it also add another textural layer that when people are inside, they can see through these little spots, these holes of the letters that are cut there in this kind of filigree. And then what is that text? You know, that would be something to decide upon. Um, I mean, we, we have a number of poet laureates here at this college. I mean, I imagine us pulling a line from a poem and maybe that becomes part of it. Or we have somebody create an original line. Maybe that becomes another part of the competition where we can have students create the line that basically speaks this piece. Then you got that and then on the creative mind going is saying that that could change over time. Because now if you have panels that are up there that are made of text that are bolted in, they can be taken out and new text can be put up. So new phrases keep coming like every five years so the piece doesn't stay static, that it now continues to transform with us. It grows with us. And that each generation can have agency in its transformation. Those are things in terms of design, in terms of interaction, is how do we get the artwork to speak? How do we get this thing to tack in? How do we communicate with it? You know. And I think part of the physical communication is going to be so beautiful when the people are putting Vaseline on their faces and we're coming there with, with, with plaster impregnated gauze, you know, and we are literally placing it on their faces, you know. This gentleman right here in the center of the composition, I'm doing a project right now um, between two churches in Lansing, Michigan. One is a Presbyterian church, which is predominantly white. And the other one is a Kojic, Church of God in Christ, which is predominantly black. They created a grant, and I've, they've been, I've been working with them for the course of a year. I'll finish up on Pentecost Sunday, working with the two churches, and getting them to engage each other and break the most segregated day of the week, which is Sunday morning. We know this. And so this was a black person's hands on his face, because when I had him come to the pavilion, I had all the people from one church and sit on that side, and the other people sit on that side. And then they were like, well, why can't we sit together? No, stay segregated. It was part of the experiential element of it. And then after we ate and after we broke bread, then we said, okay, now mingle. Then everybody went across, find your partner. Now imagine you and I meeting for the first time. Now we're coming together. And then I say to you, now you're going to make a plastic mask on her face, and he's, you're going to make one on his. You should have seen the reactions. Oh, oh. <laughs> Vaseline on my face? Oh, yeah, they were freaking out. 
And then what do we do? We took the two leaders of the churches. That's this. That's the pastor of one church. This is the woman from the, um, from the Presbyterian church. He's from the Kojic. This is me. I was, of course, I had to do it because I was trying to demonstrate to everybody what they had to do because it's the first time they ever engaged this. People had never done this before, so now I had to show them how it's done. I had to come up with a very simple system, how to do it. Three patches, all you need to cover their face. Don't cover up the nostrils. That's all you got to do. <laughs> and then they cover the faces up. And within 15 minutes, boom, we had um, a plastic copy of their face. And then we were to take molten wax and paint into that. And then they were to see a new skin come out of that plaster. And then that gets translated into that bronze. That, in that particular case, I translated those into bronze. But for this one, again, I, I got I to deal with cost factor. I want to translate them into aluminum, you know, which would be lightweight. It would give us another color texture for the piece. Um, but it will, of course, drop our cost down. So th those are the things I kept thinking about designing. How do I get the most, the most bang for the buck in terms of what we're doing and create the vision, you know, and make it happen, make it real, you know. And um, you know, that's why the other question that came about, you know, how high relief this is, because if they all dimensional figures, I guarantee you, you know, you have to do some fundraising, <laughs> you know, to make that thing happen. So, but this was this is the end of the day, you know, when we all join hands together, you know, all around that space and. Folks sang together and they separated. Then I'm gonna go back again, and I'm gonna go three more times and go back there and, and deal with the community. But that was day one. The first day I met them, and first day they met a person from another church. They had to put a plastic mask on their face, and it's quite powerful. Other questions? Yes. Hey, um, I was wondering if I could get you to talk a little about some of your thought processes um, with a certain part of the concept. Uh, if you could go back to the slide with the picture of the design. Um, I want to make the point that like monuments are around for a long time, and yep. we are going to be on a college campus. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about the conceptual ramifications of the figures being naked. Excellent, excellent question. Um, the figures will not nest. I'm going to do the Barbie effect on them, so you won't actually see uh, the genitals, and you won't actually see like the areola or the nipple. I, I, those things will be the body will be suggested or suggestive, but they will not be nude. I and mean, if you look at any, like if you came up closer and saw the figures, you'll see that there's a suggestion that the bodies are not clothed, but they, but they, um, but they won't be like straight, straight um, naked, so to speak. Or I guess my my question more was about like the conceptual side. Like it, it would make sense in some context for them to be naked. I was just wanting to get you to talk a little bit about about conceptual that? decisions. Yeah. Yes. Well, I thought I thought about. The idea of, when it, remember I talked to you about the idea of one getting more in tune with the spirit? And as part of the bamboo circle dance, they remove the clothes, those things that are attached to this earth. That's part of that spirit. This, this, is, this is really a spiritual house. This is really not real. There's no house that's literally held up with people like that. But yet it is. You know, so uh, you, you make, you're already making a conceptual jump already. Like literally, it is a house down the street that's made up of people, <laughs> you know? And it is, because all houses are made by people. It went, there's, no, there's no robots yet that just make a house and plant it just in the community. I, I'm, if they do it, I don't know who's doing it yet. But it, I'm sure it's coming. But nonetheless, um, it's, it's that human aspect. It's removed of these things, these superficial things that weigh us down. And that's, that, that's part of the conceptual idea where I went to, went to that idea. Cool, thank you. Absolutely. There's one right over there. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't really tell from the photo, but how big is the door frame? Because it looks like you have to duck underneath something to get in there. No. Um, when you come in, uh, let's go back. Is this person right here? Yes. And you see the top of the door frame here? OK. Yeah. Um, it's going to be like nine. 10 feet tall going up. So, you know, it'll, it'll be a nice clearance and nice width, especially for our handicap accessibility. So the ground's gonna be completely flattened. Well, not completely flat, it'll be slightly tapered. Because if I do go to the decision of creating it where it's porous and water comes into it, then I would like to treat it like the, um, uh, the Pantheon, no, the Parthenon was created. 
where the floor is slightly tapered from the center going out. There's a giant oculus at the top where water could come in, but all the water would run off to the sides. I want to make the, the floor out of a stamped concrete so that we can get, again, bang for the buck out of that. If we work with concrete and stain it and stamp it with a pattern on there and so forth, we also create the pattern, which will give it a little bit more texture, so reduce slippage and also put some grog in it. That'll help for that. And then the other aspect is um, we got to make sure that that egress is nice and big and wide, that a person can come in easily with a wheelchair um, into the space. And then I don't know anybody who's nine feet tall. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I'm 6'6". <six, six. laughs> Any other questions?